is covering the spread. Part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. Interesting night in Major League Baseball, where tonight I see just one money line showing value based on my numbers, and that's a lot less than usual. So we're going to break down the money line and also talk about three strikeout props I like and a dinger prop. I actually did find one I like for today, potentially a same-game parlay you can whip up together. Not typically my style, but I think for tonight, it actually does make a lot of sense. So a very unique slate for me for baseball for tonight, just following where the numbers are going, hopefully getting you some winning bets. We're going to dive on in and break down all that for today right now. Welcome on into covering the spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and numberfire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for Numberfire. Here to give you a preview of Monday across Major League Baseball, breaking down a money line, three strikeout props, and a home run prop I like for today over at FanDuel Sportsbook. We'll dive into all that here in just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to the Covering the Spread podcast feed wherever you get your podcast. Coming up later on this week, Brandon Gadula is going to preview the Charles Schwab Challenge, talk some basketball with us. That's on Tuesday. We've got an Indianapolis 500 preview coming up Thursday with Dr. Nick Giffen of the Action Network. We'll talk about the Coca-Cola 600 with him as well. I'll talk some Monaco for Formula One. So it's a big week in racing. Big week in sports in general. Should be a fun one. We'll talk some basketball, of course, with a couple of elimination games coming up later on this week. So to get all these podcasts as they are posted, make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you hear, leave us a five-star rating Apple Podcast too, and check us out over on the FanDuel YouTube page. The NBA playoffs are still chugging along, and you can get in on the action right now from first tip with FanDuel. Right now, all customers get a no-sweat same-game parlay every week weekend when you bet the NBA playoffs. That's right. Just place a three plus leg same game parlay or same game parlay plus on any NBA playoff game. You'll get bonus bet back if you don't win. There's no better place to bet all the playoff action than America's number one sports book. Head to the FanDuel app and get a no sweat same game parlay every weekend of the NBA playoffs. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA, must be 21 plus and present in select states. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. Bonus issued is non withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG. In Massachusetts, hope is here. Gambling helpline ma.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support. In New York, 1-877-8-HOPE-N-Y or text hope and y In Arizona, 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342. In Connecticut, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WIMIT. In Wyoming and Kansas, 1-800-522-4700 or in Kansas, ksgamblinghelp.com. Louisiana is 1-877-770-STOP. In Maryland, mdgamblinghelp.org. And in West Virginia, go to 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Now, as mentioned, just one MLB money line I like for tonight, despite there being a good number of games available for today. And that one money line is one that I am a little bit uncertain on because, frankly, it involves projecting out a pitcher stretching out to be a starter while he's been a reliever for this entire year. That is on the Angels and minus 108 against the Red Sox. That starter we're talking about here for the Angels, Jaime Barilla. He is moving in the rotation, Chase Silseth moving back into the bullpen. And looking at Barilla, it is always tougher to be a starter than a reliever because you're forced to go deeper in games, which means your stuff is not going to be as good. But looking at Berea in long relief this year, he has been really, really good. The velocity of his forcing fastball is up from what it was last year, even when he was a reliever then, too. In that time, he's held his opponents to a 24.2% hard hit rate, so very good hard contact number. His ERA is below two. It's not going to stick there as the sample expands, but that hard contact rate is impressive. Now, again, the stretching out thing is a big concern because we have not seen him go super, super long this year, but he has at times gone longer than 50 pitches. His max this year is 58. And if we're thinking about Berea for tonight, he's probably going to max out around 70 or so. So if he does struggle transitioning from a reliever to a starter, we might not see it tonight just because that pitch count is not going to be 
that much longer than what it's been so far this year. So that's why I feel okay on the Angels side of things. On the Red Sox side of things, they're starting Tanner Houck. Houck is due for some positive regression. His ERA does not represent how well he has pitched so far this year. So I think that the, the results, the surface level numbers do undersell Tanner Houck a bit here. But looking at this matchup, it's Berea in a, in a situation where I have a okay amount of confidence for him in the short term to be okay as this like transitioning guy from the bullpen to the rotation. I think he can handle that. So to me, I feel okay in this money line at minus 108. I do show value there on the Angels side of things. Good offense, good enough offense at least. Um, Red Sox are a good offense too, but with this game being in Anaheim, I think the Angels are the right side here. So the Angels money line minus 108, the one money line I do feel okay about for today. As mentioned, three strikeout props. Let's start with one standalone strikeout prop. Uh, that is in the Tigers versus Royals game. I want to go towards Michael Lorenzen. And Lorenzen, his over four and a half strikeouts is plus 112. And I've got him projected for 4.93 strikeouts, which is right on that precipice where it kind of winds up as a coin flip. If you look back at my projections, guys in a similar range of Lorenzen in terms of the strikeout projections, they've gone over this number of 53% of the time, which means that at plus 112, I do think there is value on the over here for Lorenzen. He is a guy who has not been in the rotation this full year at some time where he was not in the rotation to begin the year. And Lorenzen has now been fully stretched out, going 100 plus pitches or 90 plus pitches for just four starts. Despite having that small sample of him being stretched out, he has actually gone over this number, over four and a half strikeout, three separate times. Now, one of those was before he was stretched out. And, like, you know, that is, you know, a downside because it means it's not in the most representative sample, but it also means he went over this number before he was fully stretched out, which I think it should be a good thing in terms of feeling solid about him here. The Royals active roster has a 25% strikeout rate against righties this year and just a 6.3% walk rate. And that combination means you can get strikeouts against them, but they're not patient, which means you're not going to be wasting pitches trying to get those strikeouts. That can allow you to go deeper in games. And Lorenzen gets a lot of leash. His pitch count has been like in the upper 90s for each of his past four starts, even at 101 of those. And when you have... And if an opposing team that allows you to be efficient, they will strike out. They don't walk. And you got a guy who goes deep in games. Getting the, to five strikeouts is not that hard of a sell. So again, 4.93 projected strikeouts for Lorenz in here. That is not technically over four and a half. But you tend to see guys hit five strikeouts about half the time in that range. And we're getting plus money over here at plus 112. So to me... I think that makes a lot of sense. So Michael Lorenzen over four and a half strikeouts against the Royals, a bet I'm willing to make for tonight. The final three bets for tonight are all in the same game. I'm going to talk about them each individually first, because that's typically how I want to play things. And then we'll talk about the possibility of potentially pairing them together via a same game parlay over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Let's start things off here with a couple of uh, uh, strikeout props, though. Both unders on Kyle Muller and Luis Castillo. Luis Castillo's under seven and a half strikeouts is plus 110. That's a really big number. And I get it because Castillo goes deep in games, is a very good pitcher. He is at home. He's facing the A's. So I understand why this number is as high as it is. But even when you account for those things, account for the home, uh, the fact that he's at home, account for how deep he goes in games, account for the A's. I still have Castillo projected for 6.9 strikeouts tonight. So even while I'm high on Castillo, this number is pretty massive. Massive. We've got eight starts on Castillo since he cut back in his sinker usage. And in that time, Castillo has hit the over here in three out of eight games, which is not a bad number. I know it's, you know, you need to be more than that to justify uh, having plus money on the under. But all three of the times where he's hit the over come at home, and that's in just five home starts. So I don't think this number is outrageous to have him at seven and a half. I think that's kind of like FanDuel safeguarding itself. If they put it at six and a half, people are probably going to take the over there pretty easily. But there's always paths to unders when the number is this big. You need eight strikeouts for Castillo to hit the over here. You're saying he'll get there more than half the time. I think that is a good situation for us to take an under here. It's not fun to bet an under on a guy who is a legitimately good pitcher in a very good matchup at home 
it will not be a fun sweat by any means. If he got three strikeouts in the first and I could write this bet off right away, I would not be shocked. But um, I think Castillo under seven and a half plus 110 is the right side in that one. Also, as mentioned, do you like Kyle Muller under four and a half strikeouts? That's minus 116 right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. And I understand also why this number is high because it is a high strikeout matchup for Muller. The Mariners strike out a bunch against lefties. But again, my numbers know that. And even with my numbers accounting for the high strikeout nature of the Mariners, I've still got Muller projected for 3.44 strikeouts. That is well below the five he would need to hit the over on this number. Across nine starts, Muller has hit the over on this number just twice. And in all the games where he went below it, so a seven-game sample going under, he had three or fewer strikeouts in all of those. So he wasn't even getting close to this number in all the unders, and he was getting five and six in the two games where he did hit the over. Now, we could see Muller spike in a high strikeout spot. That's always possible. But I think this, this number is kind of over-accounting for the matchup, and I'm okay with that. So to me, Muller under four and a half strikeouts, uh, which is minus 116, I think there's value in that. I'm willing to take that personally. So both unders in this game, uh, Castillo under seven and a half plus 110, Muller under four and a half minus 116. I think both those are good bets right now. The home run prop I like in this game is on Teoscar Hernandez. And Teoscar Hernandez is four to one facing off with Muller. Muller does get ground balls and that could talk you out of this here, but let's up a lot of hard contact. And after Muller leaves, Teoscar Hernandez is facing the A's bullpen. That typically is going to be a recipe for some dingers. They've been better recently, but still not a good bullpen by any means. I also think that Hernandez is due for some positive regression here. He has a 340 X Woba so far this year, according to Baseball Savant, where his actual Woba is 305, so uh, about 35 po- points below his expected mark. His barrel rate still 12.9%. His ISO against lefties specifically this year, 317. Very small sample. But last year with 363, it's been above 330 for, I think, like three consecutive years before this year. So he kills lefties. So when Mueller's out there, should do well, gets the face the A's bullpen after that. I think there are a lot of factors allowing us to get to Hernandez at four to one to hit a dinger. I don't typically like numbers that short on home run props, but I think in this specific spot, it is okay. And as mentioned, all three of these bets are in the same game. So typically my philosophy is I don't like doing the same game parlays because I need every leg to show value individually. And I would like there to be some correlation between those bets in order to pair them together because I don't want to juice up a a bet and have them working against each other. Now, in theory, the Muller under and the Castillo under kind of do work a bit against each other because, you know, if Castillo gets the lead, they could let him go deeper in the game, stuff like that. So they could work against each other. But the Hernandez home run prop does actually correlate well with the under on Muller. So this actually is a situation where I'm okay if you want to Consider pairing them together. Uh, so Hernandez's home run prop is four to one. As mentioned, the unders on the strikeout props, uh, which you can put in here, uh, Cass- Muller under uh, four and a half minus 116, Castillo under seven and a half plus 110. If you pair those three together, the odds are plus 1662. So uh, between 16 and 17 to one. It's there for a reason. So as always, if you decide to pair these together, do so responsibly. Scale back your your bet size because the odds as hits are pretty low. Um, And like as someone who bets a lot of NASCAR, I know that I don't really expect a 16 to 1 bet to win on a given night. The implied odds that are 5.7%. So if we assume that FanDuel is dead on with this, they're telling you that the odds this bet hits are 5.7%. So keep that number in mind. If you decide to bet it saying there's a 95 almost percent chance this bet does not win. But I think that they all have value individually. I think that the Muller under and the Hernandez strikeout prop do play pretty well together. So this actually does fit the criteria for me where I am okay pairing those together and riding that way. It's not going to be something I do super often personally, just because of the way I like to play things. But I think in this specific situation where I happen to find three bets in the same game that I like and they play decently well together, I think it does make sense. If you want to pair those together, plus 1662 over at FanDuel Sportsbook. For that, again, 
scale responsibly, given that the odds that that hit that bet hits are very low. Um, and you want to keep that in mind when allocating your bankroll. That's going to wrap up the MLB discussion for today. Again, Angels money line minus 108. Lorenz and over four and a half strikeouts plus 112. Castillo under seven and a half strikeouts uh, plus 110. I said Lorenz and over. It is over. Uh, four and a half plus 112. Castillo under seven and a half plus 110. Muller under four and a half strikeouts minus 116. Hernandez to home run. Uh, to hit a homer uh, four to one. And again, if you want to pair those together, 1662 over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Now, before we wrap up for today, we do got, do got to go back through last week's show and recap the bet recommendations here that we discussed. And it all starts with the Preakness Stakes. Christina Blacker of FanDuel TV came on to preview the Preakness. And you can find her on Twitter at Christina FDTV. And Christina nailed it. She, when we talked, we were talking about the post draw. And she mentioned that it was an okay draw for Mage. That it was like fine. She thought the big winner, the big takeaway was that National Treasure would be on the inside and that'd be good for them wearing blinders, get off to a good pace and potentially not get caught. That's kind of how things played out to a T. So Christina got the good read there. National Treasure got the win in the race by a nose. Fantastic call by Christina. They were four to one when we talked. Um, uh, National Treasure was. They did shorten on Saturday morning, but hopefully got them. We talked uh, four to one, the number on National Treasure to win the Preakness. Great call by Christina. Check her out on Twitter at Christina FDTV. Fantastic thoughts as always from her. Check out all of her work and her colleagues' work over at FanDuel TV as well. We have Brandon Cadula on to preview the PGA Championship. Find Brandon on Twitter at Cadula13 and check out all of his golf work over at numberfire.com. Brooks Kepka getting the win and uh, not on Brandon's card for this week, but Kepka. Miss golfed really well. Uh, did get a threat from Victor Hovland there down the stretch on Sunday, which made things pretty interesting. But uh, Hovland had one bad hole, and that kind of sealed things off for Kepka to win his fifth major at the age of, I think, 33, which is pretty nuts. Uh, the outrights in Brandon were Xander Shoffley, 17 to 1, Patrick Cantley, 20 to 1, Colin Morikawa, 34 to 1. Pretty weird field with the way a lot of the High end guys performed. Obviously, Kepka won. Rory was pretty good. Scheffler was good, but a lot of guys like Rom underperformed. So, bit odd in that sense. No outrights there. The top 10 bet was Tony Finau at uh, plus 210. Uh, Finau did not make that. And then the matchup bet, Sung J M minus 118 over Tyrrell Hatton. M missed the cut, whereas Hatton finished 15. So, couldn't get that one done there, but Brandon's given us a lot of winners uh, throughout uh, the year. So looking to get back on track with that again. Tomorrow's talk about the Charles Schwab Challenge. Austin Cass was our guest on to preview match week 37 in the EPL. You can check out Austin on Twitter uh, at Austin Cass. You can find his work over at Number Fire as well. We still have one left to go. It's Alexander Isak to score today at minus 105. But on Saturday, Austin had the Wolves over one half goals at plus 164. They scored in the 34th minute, so they had more than half the game to half the match to hit the over there, but couldn't punch another one in, uh, so no hit on that one. Other one was Brighton over two and a half goals, a minus 111 when we talked. Now, Austin had said he wanted to see their lineup before betting it, uh, but by then, it had gotten out to minus 150. So it was minus 11, 111 when we talked, minus 150 or so at close. Either way, it did hit. Uh, they won three to one over Southampton. So hopefully you bet it right away. But if you did follow Austin's uh, recommendation, hold off to bet it. You got it at minus 150 there and you did get the win there. So not the same payout, but I think Austin's thought process of they played a game Thursday, playing against Sunday, might not play the regular guys. I respect that thought process. So I probably would have gone Austin's way personally. Uh, so minus 150, but still a cash regardless on that one. As for my stuff in uh, the racing side of things, in the truck series on Saturday, I had Christopher Bell to win at 6-1, to one, Ross Chastain top five at plus 225, and Stuart Friesen top five at 4-1. to one. Bell had a very good truck, but he got some damage. Uh, he was trying to cut down, and he hit his left front fender on a truck. I think it was Byron. Uh, so he was trying to get down. And had a bad pit stop late, was not competitive after that. So that one didn't work. Friesen and Chastain weren't quite there either. So no dice in the truck series on that one. In the all-star open race, I said I had value in Ty Gibbs to win at four to one. And I didn't say to bet at them. I said I wanted to wait until the pit crew competition because I thought there was a shot that Gibbs might not qualify super well for the all-star open. Instead, his pick crew is the fastest of the entire field. They won $100,000 for it and Gibbs started the poll. So that was good for the, if you had taken Ty Gibbs at four to one to win, 
but he shortened to plus 210 after that. And I couldn't show value there. I had gives a 27%, I think, to win the All-Star Open. So I wound up not getting him because I had to wait. I wanted to wait for the, that inflection point where he didn't have a lot of control on uh, Friday night to see if he'd lengthen. Instead, he shortened a lot and he shortened too much. So I couldn't get Ty Gibbs in my card. So that was a bummer. But then it was less of a bummer because Ty Gibbs actually finished second in the race. He had the best car, I think, pretty clearly. But he had gotten to Michael McDowell early in the race. McDowell took umbrage with that and effectively just blocked Gibbs uh, when Gibbs was trying to lap him later on. That allowed Josh Berry to get past him. And Josh Berry went on to win the All-Star Open. Uh, so it was a bummer to miss out on good CLV when I had the right read on Ty Gibbs. But it would have been a losing bet. So no complaints. That's the other side of the thing we're talking about the Austin's bet, where sometimes you wait for a reason and sometimes waiting bites you and you miss out on a good bet or you get a good bet at a worse number. But sometimes it actually does save you. So, you know, I still think Ty Gibbs is a good bet at four to one. I don't think he's a good bet at plus 210. And I think that's kind of the way things play out. So uh, no bet recommendation in the All-Star Open. In the All-Star main event, uh, the two bet recommendations were Kyle Larson at seven to one and Ross Chastain at 14 to one. I got a lucky win here that I probably did not deserve. What happened was Larson and Chastain both had issues during their heat race and they qualified poorly. So I think Larson was 16th and Chastain was 18th. So they started in the back. There was a caution about 17 laps in and teams had limited tires for this race. It's a track where there's a lot of tire fall off and Larson's team decided, we think this race is going to be, have a lot of green flag runs. And if they, if that happens, our advantage is having fresh tires. So Larson's team pitted. A lot of other teams did not. And because they wanted to keep a fresh set of tires in the pits, the race went green pretty much the, I think that was the only actual caution outside of the competition caution, the entire race. So Larson went from dead last. Cause he was also speeding up here road to first in that opening stage. And then ran wire to wire on the, op uh, after the competition caution as well. So Larson got very fortunate. I think his car was good. I'm not sure if it was good, at, like as good as it looked. I think there were other cars that were better than him, but once he got track position, he was nuts. Uh, so Larson, you could have gotten a 10 to one on Saturday, which is why I think this is a bad bet uh, on my behalf at seven to one. But sometimes you get lucky and I'm not going to complain about getting lucky because we've had plenty of unlucky things happen too, specifically with Larson, uh, you know, getting wrecked in the last, well, wrecking himself in the last lap with, with Denny Hamlin. And then also at the Dover race with Ross Chastain wrecking a lap car. So I've had bad luck with Larson. I'll take some good luck here and cash the seven to one didn't deserve it, but I'll take it either way. So not a bad week on the show uh, with the Preakness and uh, the Larson win, but we'll see what we can do for this week. Uh, hopefully starting things off on a high note with the MLB for tonight. That is all that we have here for today on the show back once again, tomorrow to talk to you, Brandon Gadula about the Charles Schwab challenge. We'll talk some NBA with Brandon as well, getting his thoughts on that. To get that as it is posted, make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. Also check us out over on the FanDuel YouTube page. If you like what you hear, give us a thumbs up on YouTube or give us a five-star rating over on Apple Podcasts. If you've got any questions for me, I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcasts. I want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your MLB bets for tonight. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow to talk more golf. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 